Welcome back, everyone, to another exciting day of 107. Today, a couple announcements before we get into things. Uh, first, since we last saw each other in lecture, we released the midterm grades. Hopefully, you all got emails from Gradescope and were able to access uh, your midterm grades. The website, the course website, has the exam solutions as well as uh, some information about you know, how the midterm was graded and uh, any and the instructions for submitting regrade requests and things like that. So if any of that uh, applies to you, please make sure you check out the website for the full details of what that looks like. Uh, assignment five is well on its way. Hopefully, many of you are seeing that. Uh, seeing that through and kind of getting getting kind of near the final stages of that. Um, hopefully you enjoyed the brief excursion into just something a little different uh, from just constant C code writing. Uh, assignment six will go out over the weekend, and and we'll be uh, kind of you know seeing this seeing we kind of in the in the home stretch of things here. All right. The, the plan for today, uh, so we've finished our discussion of assembly on Monday. So we're not really, so we've talked through all the mechanics of, you know, what the, the kind of translation between C and assembly looks like. And so now we're going to kind of zoom out a little bit more. And um, so the next kind of, pretty much the kind of rounding out the lectures, we're going to be looking at kind of just more sort of systems concepts. And, it's not that the assembly in the C that we've been working so hard on throughout the last uh, seven weeks uh, is not going to be relevant. We'll see, in fact, today um, where our knowledge of assembly will make a pretty big difference in terms of understanding what, what's happening. Um, but we're going to just try to focus on like, what the, just some kind of higher level, um, higher level concepts. And for today, what we're going to do is we want to talk through what it means to build a program. So. For seven weeks now, we've all probably gotten used to just going into a directory and typing make and then just having a program build. I'll go ahead and make clean just to kind of make a point of that. So, you know, we see a few output lines and more often than maybe sometimes we even should, we'll ignore the output lines um, and just say, yeah, sure, I type make and my program is built and that's great. Um, our goal today is going to be to understand what exactly is happening. So we want to know what exactly each of these lines do. Uh, and what the kind of intermediate steps are. There are even some steps that are not being shown by make here uh, that are that are uh, you know that are contributing to taking a C program that you wrote and turning it into a an executable program that you can run. Okay, and the one of the main reasons that we're interested in doing this right is that we want. Ultimately, if there, you know, we, you've seen, I'm sure you've run into a variety of build errors, like you've, you know, compiled and you've gotten some syntax errors, or you've gotten some undeclared variables, or missing missing prototypes and things like that. And our goal is going to be to understand where those errors came from as a kind of stepping stone to how exactly do we fix them. And we'll start seeing a couple of places today where the type of error and you know, which step of the process generates that error will give us a lot of information about how we as a programmer can respond to that error. Um, and that certain errors require a very different fix um, than others. And so that knowing, you know, how to, how to categorize those, these errors more broadly will allow us to um, figure out where to focus our attention when developing. Okay? So rather than um, go through a bunch of slides, because I'll be kind of moving through a lot of stuff, and I think it's really important to kind of see uh, the big picture, like kind of just or see like kind of in real time as we build these programs and things. Uh, I've got this little notes file um, that I'm going to be updating as we go through uh, the lecture today, and so I've got a little section kind of overviewing the the steps of the build process, and then I've got. Um, Couple of pieces of information down here, and so I'll, I'll walk through this this file kind of one step at a time. So don't worry about trying to catch, uh, you know, catch catch it all now. Okay. All right. So let's get into it. Uh, the first piece that I do want to talk about, and I won't spend a huge amount of time on it, but I just want to you know make make sure that we're we uh, realize that it's there, 
is to understand what exactly make does. So there have been a couple of occasions already in lab where you were told to go into the make file and make some changes, you know, change how uh, make was compiling your program, maybe with optimizations, or uh, maybe for assignment three, you wanted to add an extra test program, so then you had to go into the make file. And so, you know, I just kind of want to give a sort of nod to what exactly the make file is doing for us um, and why and how that works. So when I type make, what make does is it looks at our make file here. And it uses, it uses the make file as kind of a recipe to know how to build programs. So I won't go into like every detail, but I'll, I'll point out a couple things that make, make some points. So for example here, um, you can see this, this rule, There's, there are some comments. These comments have been in the make files kind of uh, throughout the class, but I'll just kind of draw your attention to this line in particular uh, for this rule says that if I have a dot C program, so you can read the percent as kind of a, just a, of something to be filled in. So if I have, you know, hello dot C and I want to create hello dot O, um, this line gives a recipe to make that says, here is how you would actually create hello.o using hello.c. And then if we go down a little further, we have a line that says, okay, from a particular dot o file like hello.o, here is how I would create the program hello. Yeah. And so we can set you know, some variables and we can set certain compiler flags and things like that um, for specifying how this works. But then if I type, and so I, but I pointed out two rules, and if I, now if I type make hello, um, okay, so that one actually, it looks like it skipped a, oh right, so that's gonna skip a thing. Let's, let me make clean real quick. But if I do make here, then you can kind of see both of those steps happening here. So let's take the, the pre.c program, um, right, because I, so here you can see the, I have pre.c and I'm turning it into uh, pre.o, right, I'm skipping over a lot of flags here because they kind of mostly don't matter. And then in the next step, using a different recipe, I'm taking a pre.o file and I'm turning it into the executable pre. Yeah? Um, so, so make is pretty convenient for this kind of thing. It means that we don't have to type all of these lines over and over again. Uh, it's Make is not reserved just for working with C programs. We could technically, you know, you could, you could, anything that can be kind of scripted, anything where a file should be generated from a collection of other files, um, can be handled with make files. And there are uh, lots of interesting examples where you can use make to kind of just automate certain simple tasks. You know, this is the kind of thing that. Um, that you, you do on a com in a command line environment if you just, you know, you don't have like a convenient sort of like automation tool that lets you just kind of, um, you know, do a bunch of mouse clicks. If I just need, uh, if I just need to execute a sequence of commands um, to generate uh, various outputs from various inputs, uh, make is a viable tool for that. Uh, with the one limitation being that it's very hard to read make files. Um, that's, that's a thing, uh, but other than that, you know, it's a pretty de facto standard for building programs, at least. Right. So that's kind of the, the, you know, that's the extent to which I really want to talk about makefiles. Um, nobody ever really writes a makefile from scratch. Uh, that's you often hopeless, uh, just because there are so many weird syntactic uh, quirks about it. Um, so if you ever find yourself needing to modify a make file or, you know, needing a make file for your own project, uh, you could probably just use the one from 107 and kind of make some modifications to it. So, um, yeah. But what I really want to focus on is I want to focus on these calls to GCC. And so we've seen, uh, we've seen over and over again uh, throughout the, the class, you know, every time we type make, we see something about GCC. And it's finally time we figure out what exactly is going on in there. Right. And so we have up till now pretty much been calling GCC the compiler, right? We said, oh yeah, you know, GCC is our compiler; it, it builds the program. But what GCC actually is, the like the command GCC, is actually the compiler driver. 
And by compiler driver, what I mean is that there are several steps to building a program, and GCC is in charge of running each of those steps. And so the way we can actually see this happen is if I just clear the screen here, if I type, if I use the command GCC minus V, here V stands for verbose, and I ask to compile hello.c, this is going to ask GCC to compile the program, but also include a whole bunch of information about what it's doing behind the scenes. And so there we see just a ton of output, right? Uh, it's going to be pretty infeasible for us to really go through it, but I can highlight a couple of aspects here where um, here you can see a call to a program called collect2. Um, and if I go up even more, here you can see a call to a program called AS. Um, and I won't, I won't try to really pinpoint each of those. But scattered within this verbose output of GCC are calls to each of these four steps. So here's a quick kind of overview of what the steps are. And so what happens is I call GCC on hello.c, and it will run each of these steps. And if I don't specify any flag, so I didn't use any of the flags listed on this page for preprocessor, compiler, assembler, then what that tells GCC is I want to build the entire program. So run the entire process from start to finish and give me an executable at the end. And so what we'll be seeing today is how we can stop GCC at various steps and say, I only want you to run the preprocessor. And I want you to tell me what that results in. Or I only want you to run uh, the preprocessor and the compiler and see what that, what that results in. Okay. So we're just going to go down each of these steps one by one. Um, and we're going to talk about what the input of that step takes, right? So the input of the first step, uh, the preprocessor, for example, takes the .c file, uh, the actual source code that we wrote. And we're going to talk about what it outputs, and we're going to talk about what it does. And I'll fill in the purposes as we go. So far, so good? OK. So let's just get into the first step. We'll pull up pre.c to talk about what the preprocessor does. Okay, so the first step of every of, of a call to, to GCC is, um, is that we will run the preprocessor. And what that step does is that the preprocessor is in charge of filling in, or kind of resolving in a sense, kind of handling pound includes, pound defines, basically anything that starts with a pound, uh, the preprocessor will deal with it. Alright. Sick. <laughs> okay, so here we've got a couple of examples of pound defines, and you've used some of these throughout uh, throughout the quarter, right? You've you've seen pound define as a way of defining constants. We can use them in kind of more complex ways. We can define, uh, you know, something like one left shift four into a into a define. Um, they're not restricted to numbers. We can be, use them as strings and, and whatnot as well. And I can show you a, an example uh, use of a couple of these um, where I can say int num equals that expression. I can say int array equals the number, uh, and so on. Um, there's one other thing the preprocessor can do, which we haven't been talking about because it's a little bit unsafe as it were, and you'll explore in lab what, what that means exactly for uh, preprocessor macros to be unsafe. But we can also define a, a, a sort of a, 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 so what is called a macro, and what it does is it, it actually takes an argument. And so here we define abs of x, which will be filled in with, and so instead of, and, and it'll actually essentially do this block of code. The key to understand about what the preprocessor is doing is that the preprocessor does not know C code. 
It does not know the language. And so all it can really do is it can go through your code and find and replace every use of these pound defines with whatever shows up after the name. So let me actually show you that, right? So I'm going to switch over to another terminal. And I'm going to build pre.c, but I'm going to stop after the preprocessor. So I'll say GCC minus capital E, which is the flag that we use to say, after you're done preprocessing, don't do anything else on pre.c. And so here, uh, there's a bunch of stuff at the top that I'm going to skip. But here you can see our function for main. And you can see that where we said int num equals expression, the preprocessor essentially did a find and replace on expression and filled that in. And where we said, uh, you know, int array bracket number, it find and replaced number with 42. And even for the uh, absolute value one, it filled in x with whatever we put inside the parens for abs, and then just find and replace again on this line. Okay? And that's all it does. Um, it also handles pound includes. I'll show you pound includes in a second. But as a result of this kind of very brute force find and replace uh, processing, right, we can really get ourselves into trouble with the preprocessor. So at the beginning, I showed you something like I said when I first talked about pound define, like in you know lecture number two or something. I said, hey, watch out, pound define does not get an equal sign or a semicolon. So now we can actually talk about what happens if I go up here and I say pound define number equals forty two semicolon. What's going to go wrong? Is the preprocessor going to say no? That's the wrong syntax. Is it going to you know help us really figure out what went wrong? Well, let me save and switch over here and do a GCC minus capital E again on pre.c. And we can see what happened there. Right? Find and replace. It says, OK, everything that shows up on the right hand side of number, right? So here, number is this thing, equals 42 semicolon. We will take that, we'll search for the word number, and anywhere you say number, we're going to put that. So right here, we're just going to write that in. Now, of course, this is going to be a syntax error, right? But the preprocessor is not going to is not going to notice that. We didn't. I I stopped compilation after the preprocessing step, and I didn't see any errors. Now, if I try to make pre, I will get a syntax error. Right, which says, hey, by the way, uh, that's going to be a problem. But that error is not coming from the preprocessor. And one of the big things we want to take away from today's lecture is how do we know? How do we know which step produced the error? Well, in this case, I know that the preprocessor didn't produce this error because when I only ran the preprocessor, it didn't say anything. Question so far? So I'm going to fill this in really quickly here. Uh, uh, handles pound include. I'll show you the pound include in a second. Pound defines. And then I guess I'll make it, in, I'll put it in a different section where the preprocessor, so far we haven't seen it handle any errors, but it's not going to handle. Uh, Will not right um, handle syntax errors in pound define, right? So I made an error in the pa you could say, hey, well the error was in this pound define, right? I shouldn't have written this equals forty two semicolon on the pound define. Preprocessor didn't catch that. Okay. So now the other thing, and then, um, yeah. And then I guess now just a super quick note that you'll actually notice that the assert also got replaced 
um, with a with kind of this this expansion, which actually tells us that some of the things that we've been using pretty much asserts the main one uh, that we've been using so far and kind of thought of as functions are actually preprocessor uh, macros, and so they're actually getting handled um, at this stage, right? The preprocessor expand turn assert uh, you know array bracket zero double equals whatever into into whatever it expanded to, and that was inside of assert.h. Okay. Uh, so let me actually, I'll probably fix this bug so that we don't get ourselves into a, a bit of a bind there. Oops. Oh, I guess I, okay. Okay. So the other one I want to talk about, oh, and then, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll do it. I'll do that here. Uh, the other one, the other thing I want to talk about the preprocessor doing is that it fixes uh, pound includes. So here I've got uh, include dot C, and there's actually a header file, include dot H, right, which just has a, a type def. Um, it has a function prototype also, but so here's our include dot H file, right? It defines a, a fraction structure. Um, so think about something like c vector dot h, just having the you know the type def for c vector. And here we've got, oops, uh, here we've got a a pound include of of that. So what's gonna so what what does the preprocessor do here? Let me just run the preprocessor on this. Okay, so gcc minus e on include dot c, and we can actually see pretty much what it exactly what it does. Um, First of all, a super quick note, uh, notice that there was a comment at the top of the file, and the preprocessor got rid of that too. It says, yeah, these comments, right, they're really useful for a human reader, but they are not useful for the machine, so we're just going to strip those away right away. And then you'll notice that the contents of inc.h, right, the prototype and the type def struct were just copy-pasted right into our file. And then you know the rest of our file continues from here. Question? Yep. Does it then matter in what order you, you do the hashtag include? Does it so the question is does it matter what order in what sense? In the sense that if one refers to another or they structure the way that ah. they don't need each other. Yeah, good question. So the question is uh, like does the order of pound includes matter? For example, if one pound include um, if, or if you know one uh, yeah, if one header file needed a different header file. Um, generally speaking it kind of does, right? So, for example, the ex so the example I'll show you here is like, what happens if I pound include something twice? Like, is the preprocessor going to do anything special here? And the answer is going to be well. Here, let's. So I, I added two includes of inc dot h, and we can actually see that it didn't do anything special. That the preprocessor really is going to just do this kind of you know, this kind of blind copy paste here, right? Like, oh, you want to include ink.h? All right, I'll do it. Oh, you want to include ink.h again? Okay, I'll do it. And so what this means is that generally the, the convention that we want to follow with our header files is that if the header file depends on some other header, so let's say that, you know, something in ink.h needed stdio or something, then we should put that include inside of the header file. We don't really want the order of includes to matter, but if we program, if we write our header file sloppily, then it can. Okay. Other questions? So now we can say, all right. So again, the preprocessor had no problem with this. It just did the include twice. But now we can say, well, is anybody else going to have a problem with it? Right? Um, like, we kind of see that. And in fact, the answer is yes. Right? So a later step, I'll mention which step in a moment, but a later step did not like the fact that we declared, uh, that we defined this struct twice. Um, but the preprocessor didn't care. Right? The preprocessor is at this point, pretty much happy to make errors for everybody else to solve. 
right? Like, oh, you called a pound include, you did it wrong, you have a pound to find that's wrong. Like, I'm not going to be the one who's going to look for it. I'm just going to do what you said and then pass on the output, this output, to the next step and let the next step figure it out. So I'll just show uh, somewhat, you know, maybe a little quickly what exactly, what the solution is to solve a problem of double including, because sometimes it happens, right? It's not that, you know, you might say, well, why, why would we ever include a file twice? But sometimes it happens as part of just, you know, file A includes file B includes file C, um, and then maybe we also include file C and, you know. Um, and so the, the strategy to solve this problem is to use this other preprocessor directive that we haven't seen so far uh, called if and def. And so what we're going to do, I'll just write it out. Um, and so what we're actually get, what this is actually going to do is the way to read this is if inc.h has not been included yet, then go ahead and include all the stuff, but then also set a flag, right? So pound define inc.h so that we don't accidentally include it again. So now if I save this, and I still have my double include, and I do GCC minus capital E on inc.c, then we can actually see that um, I've actually only included the type def once. Because of, yep. Why do you have to use an underscore? Uh, so the question is, so why do I have to use an underscore in the if def? Yeah. Uh, because you're not allowed to define stuff with dots in them. Yeah. Um, so this is sort of a convention. You, you could give this whatever name you want. You could say, you know, inc h included or whatever, right? As long as they two, the, both of them match, then you're okay. Um, but it's pretty conventional to just use something like this. And so this is called an include guard. Um, and it protects against uh, multiple includes. Okay? All right. And so I should say, you know, so what does the preprocessor handle, right? What, what kind of errors does it check for? Um, there's pretty much, there's one really kind of main one, which is that if I include something that doesn't exist, like a bogus.h, I can run the preprocessor. Remember, I always want to keep only running the preprocessor so that I can see what errors it specifically catches. If I run GCC minus capital E to only run the preprocessor, then the preprocessor outputs this fatal error that says, I can't include this. So we can conclude that the preprocessor um, will not uh, catch errors like syntax errors and things like that, but what it'll probably catch is, um, you know, so I'm actually just going to get rid of this, and I'm just going to say, you know, not that, but it's going to catch uh, non existent, existent uh, .h file. I'll say non-existent pound include. Yeah? <coughs> cool. So now that the preprocessor has executed, any questions about the <coughs> preprocessor? So now that the preprocessor has executed, we get out, um, I'm calling it .i file. So actually, I should maybe just show this uh, quickly, which is that if I make hello in here, um, that we've actually set a special flag where the intermediate steps of, um, of the hello process are being generated. So you could go in and look at these files if you wanted to. Um, so you could see that, so hello.i would be the output of the preprocessor um, and hello and so on. Right. Um, oh well. Question? Yeah. Oh yeah. So the question is, if you have two .h files that like keep including each other, uh, if you don't have that, would something pretty crazy happen? Um, probably. Um, I guess it depends on 
how it's processing it. Um, but yeah, that, the guard will definitely protect against that, right? So the, and that's and that's going to be one of the big reasons um, for having it. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So if I call something like pound include bogus.h, right? Like, what do I do? You know, so the file doesn't exist, right? There is no bogus.h. Um, so then, who's going to notice that? Well, the preprocessor, when it goes in and says, "Okay, I'm supposed to copy and paste bogus.h into this file," it says, "I can't do that." And so then, we see that the preprocessor actually produced the error for that, right? So here, um, we tried to run just the preprocessor. Right. right. We tried to run just the preprocessor, and it said, I, I can't continue. So it did handle that, yes. OK? All right. So now we'll, what we've got. So now what we've got is this, it still looked like C code, right? Like the preprocessor didn't change our code very much. It just, it still left it as kind of C code, um, but just got rid of some pound includes, got rid of the pound defines, filled some stuff in, did some find and replacing. And so now we've got this kind of preprocessed C code, and now we go to the next step, which is the compiler. Um, so, so here you can see the kind of the flag that we'd run to stop at the compiler, um, which is GC minus capital S. And what the compiler is going to be responsible for is it's going to translate C to assembly. So this is where pretty much all the heavy lifting is done. Okay. So if I look at so if I look at something like hello.c, uh, I'm going to here I'm going to get rid of this include so it doesn't break. And if I look at hello.c, which is kind of your standard printf, you know, hello, percent %s, whatever. Um, so here's your kind of normal program. Um, we're going to preprocess this, right? So maybe I can even look at the preprocessed output, hello.i, right? Here you can see all the junk that came out. Here you can kind of see all the junk that came out from pound including stdio.h. We can kind of see what's in there is we've got all this Oh man, who even knows? But I'm going to skip it all. And we're going to come down and we still see our C code, right? So this is the output. So this is hello.i, which is the output of our preprocessor. This all goes into the compiler. And what the compiler is going to generate is the file hello.s. And that looks like this. Uh, so here, Right, this looks pretty familiar to things like the that we were looking at before with GCC Explorer and whatnot. Now we have assembly, right? We got the we got a you know our main, we've got our subs and our comps and all the usual kind of things. There's a call to printf down here somewhere, right? And so you can kind of figure this is where a lot of the work has to happen, right? That translation from taking you know printf paren hello percent s uh, to turning into this the move and the jump and the call and the whatnot. That's where all the all the all the magic of the C language happens. And in particular, so in in fact, so therefore pretty much all of the a lot of the errors that are gonna come out of the build process, so things like, hey, you call the, you know, you uh, you know you you used a variable that doesn't exist. Or you have the wrong C syntax. These are all things that the compiler is going to handle. So they come down here. You know we've got syntax errors, undefined, uh, or un, I'll say undeclared variables. And in fact, all of the type checking is also going to happen here. So we have to keep in mind that from as we go from one step to the next. Each step is only looking at its particular input file and producing its one output file. So it is not the case that, so after we get to this point, after we are here at the assembly level, 
We don't have any type information anymore. This is a theme that we kept, you know, kept coming up when we talked about assembly. We don't have any type information here. So we don't, just from looking at the assembly, we would not know whether, you know, what type got stored in EDI or what type got stored in ESI. Right? And so as a result, if anybody's going to do the type checking, if anybody's going to tell us, hey, I think you passed a care star when you should have passed an int or, you know, or you should have, you know, the incompatible conversion of a pointer to an integer or vice versa, that's all has to get handled by the compiler because no step from here on out will have any type information whatsoever. Because now we're at the assembly and that's it. No type information. Okay. Alrighty. Questions about the compiler? Um, this is obviously where all the hard work happens, but it also means that we're not, you know, like this is where this is what you learn about if you take compilers is like how to build one of these things, how to do those translations. That's not a detail that those aren't details that we're really that interested in um, for this class. We're more interested in kind of the, the steps around it um, to understand how uh, we take that assembly and, and get to a, a final product. So now we've got this .s file, right? We've got a file that we can still open up in our text editor, right? We can still look at it. I can still, you know, there are still characters in here, right? I could technically, you know, delete the O and move L. That would be a bad idea. This wouldn't be a valid, uh, you know, this wouldn't be a valid assembly instruction anymore. But it's still text, right? Um, now when I go to the next step, I actually messed up something, so. Um, the next step is going to be to make, oh, is it there? Oh, it was stacking. Uh, if I go to the next step, the next step is the assembler. And what the assembler is going to do is it's going to take the output, is it's going to take this thing, right, this assembly, and it's going to turn it into hello.o. I'm going to try to open up hello.o. Uh, but now, now we have no success. So from here on, the, the, primary role of the assembler is going to be to take our, so, so you actually, you know, so for assignment four, you did a disassemble component, right? Where you took some bytes, some, uh, the, the encoding of some of these instructions and you printed out the push, right? And what that corresponded to. The assembler is going to go the other way. It's going to take all of these text instructions, and it's going to turn them into a binary file. And so now that we have a binary file, we're not really going to be able to look at it in a text editor and get anything useful out of it. So we need some other strategies. Okay. So let's, let's do that. First, let me just briefly kind of mention what exactly is a .o file? Um, what, what is this sort of contained in this binary file? Um, and this is something that will come up for assignment six as we kind of get into that, that space of things. So a dot O file is an example of what we call an ELF file. And so I can use tools, so I can't use the text editor anymore to look at these dot O files. I can use tools like this one, read ELF minus h, to look inside this .o file. And it tells us a couple things about it. It says that this is a 64, this is an x86-64, uh, this has x86-64 code in it. It tells us that it uses two's complement. Uh, it's little endian. These are things that we've kind of run into. Um, and this, the .o file is called a relocatable. So, this is just kind of a quick overview of what's in the .o file. But here's another way that we can look at what's in the .o file. We can use a command objump, which you've probably already used uh, for binary bomb, right? So we can look inside hello.o and we can actually see the assembly instructions that are coming out. But 
don't be deceived by the output over here, the moves and stuff. We do not have an MOV character stored inside the .o file. What's actually in the .o is this. These bytes are stored there. And what objdump is doing is it is doing exactly what you did in assignment 4. It is disassembling these bytes to tell us what the text equivalents are. Okay? So one thing to notice right away here uh, about .o files that's going to come up is that, um, for example, this call, which we understood to be a call to printf, uh, did not get filled in correctly, or has not been filled in yet. And the problem is, at this point, so, okay, first of all, quick kind of high level on what the assembler does. Let me come back to that point. So it's going to, I want to actually use the word transliterate here. And what I mean here is that assembly to machine instructions. And what I mean here is that you'll notice just at a high level, every instruction that you see in this .s file shows up in the .o file, one for one. Right? There's not, um, this is not kind of this very fancy work that the compiler was doing, kind of moving stuff around and lining up, you know, uh, uh, you know, generating the right assembly for each line of C and so on. This is really just kind of a one-to-one. -one. Every one of these lines gets turned into a certain number of bytes, and that's it. All right, so each of those lines you'll see kind of maps over here. But one thing that is that we haven't been able to do so far is that up until now all of these three steps Right, have been operating on one file at a time. So this one takes binky.c and turns into binky.i. This one takes binky.i and turns it into binky.s. This one takes binky.s and turns it into binky.o. In no consideration whatsoever to any other files that may exist, that may be, you know, part of the pro same program. And so in our hello.c, we call printf, but we didn't write printf, right? Somebody else wrote printf. And so what, so what the assembler is going to do is it's going to leave a placeholder. It's going to say hello.o contains inside of it a call uh, to printf, um, and you can actually see that using a command nm, and I'll, nm will come up uh, more throughout. But here we can actually see, so nm is going to tell us what things are defined inside of the hello program and what things are, are undefined. So here we can see that um, hello.o contains a definition for main, and the t means that it's a function. But it, it has a call to printf, and that u means that we didn't define printf. We didn't write it. And so hello.o is going to depend on printf wherever that's located. And so it was not the assembler's job to, to solve that. So it's going to leave a placeholder that says eventually this call needs to get filled in with a call to printf, but that's not my job. Okay? And so I will say briefly um, what, what errors does the assembler catch? Well, it turns out uh, none, right? The assembler isn't going to really report any errors uh, as long as compiler generated good assembly, right? So the assembler, the, the compiler put out that .s file, um, and that .s file has, you know, those assembly instructions. If I went into that .s file and I, you know, rewrote move L to, you know, MV or something like that, well, yeah, then the assembler would complain and say that's not a valid instruction. But if we're just following the steps one by one, um, the compiler is always going to generate good assembly because that's its job, right? And so then the assembler doing this very one-to-one, -one, you know, one assembly line to one machine instruction kind of translation is not going to notice anything else. All right.
Questions? Okay. So here I'm actually going to do, I want to pull up a different example um, that I think is a little bit uh, more, more elucidating here. Uh, so actually, let me do this one instead. So here I just have this .c file uh, called util.c. Um, we've got a couple of functions in it. We've got a call to you know malloc. Uh, there's a function called malloc memset, um, and there's a call to um, and there's a call to to dinky. Uh, there's a function dinky, um, and there's a little max function that we're calling, right? And so if I look at so I'll go over here and okay. So now what we need to do? Let me point out a couple more things about. About the dot o file. So the first thing you'll notice. So the, a couple of other things you'll notice about this dot o file. So we don't see, uh, you know, so we do see a, a call to, to max filled in. But you know, as we saw with, as we saw with hello dot o, right? We didn't see any. Um, we didn't see the call to printf. So here there should be a call to malloc, and there should be a call to memset, and we don't see either of those. Because they're they're undefined, right? The other thing that's really kind of noteworthy about this dot o file is that if you recall the addresses that you were seeing when you did object dot minus d on bomb, these addresses are much smaller. And you'll notice that if I come all the way up here, uh, the addresses start at zero. And so the problem is that. One program could be made up of a whole bunch of different files, right? It could be made up of a bunch of different .c files, including things like libraries and also just so you think about like C vector and C map were in separate .c files. And so what what we have in a .o file, and this, this goes back to calling it a relocatable uh, object, is that we've just got a bunch of machine instructions, and then the last step of the process, the linker. Is going to take so if I make clean and I'll show you, um, I'll show you this line here. This is the linker line. If I don't put any flags to GCC, I get, I automatically invoke the linker, and here you can see that I'm passing it two different .o files, and it will produce the one main executable. Okay. And the linker is the only step that is working with multiple files. So what the linker needs to do is it's going to, I'll tell you what both of these things mean in a moment, resolve symbols, um, and then it will set uh, the address layout. And so what I mean by this is, so the, the dot o file has small addresses, Undefined symbols, right? So we saw the small addresses when we did the uh, the obj jump. We saw the undefined symbol when I did the nm. So here, if I do an nm on util.o, for example, we see that there's an undefined reference to malloc or malloc. There's an undefined reference to memset, and also printf. All right. And so it's the linker's job to do both to do two things. First, it's going to fill in these undefined symbols. So if I do an obj dump minus d, uh, this is going to be pretty hard to dig through, but of the main executable program. So no extension means that we have an executable. Um, right. So it's a mess because it brought in all the library stuff. But what's going to be important in here, uh, if I if I dig through it far enough, here it is. Actually, I found it. Uh, is that you can see that there was a resol there was now there are now calls to malloc, and there are now calls to memset. And so it filled those in, right? It filled in those undefined symbols. The other thing that it did is it just picked an address where our code will ultimately live when we run the program. So. It turned all those little tiny addresses that started with zero into these kind of addresses that look more familiar to us from our work with bomb, uh, you know, starting at 400,000. And as it turns out, the linker gets to just pick them, right? It could have started 
you know, it could have put our program at 500,000 or at a million or whatever. It just gets to pick a number. Okay. So far, so good. Questions? Okay. So then, kind of the, you know, sort of the follow on here is okay, so now what, what is the linker actually? What does the linker actually do? And so, um, so, so what we've got the what does the linker actually do? And so, what, where can this go wrong, right? Why would this ever create a problem? Um, let me. So let's let's just we're basically gonna for the this part we're just gonna kind of go over a couple of different examples and just there are some very specific errors that the linker will generate, and so what can go wrong, right? If I try to resolve, if I'm resolving symbols and setting the addresses. Well, the addresses, it's going to be fine. I can always pick them. So what can go wrong when I resolve symbols? Okay, let me, let me do that. Uh, so I'm going to open up main.c and util.c. So let's imagine uh, if I've got, what do I want to do first here? Let's imagine if I, um, if I, so down here you can see here. Let's go to main, and down here you can see a call to Dinky, right, of 107. And over here you can see I don't define Dinky anywhere, right? I have a prototype for it, but that's it. So what happens? And and so Dinky is defined over here in util.c, right? What happens if I just don't? What if I just comment this entire thing out? So let's try that. And then we call it over there. Okay. So here we can see the the the, me the error. Let me actually do something different. Um, let me let me go all the way through. And so here we can see where the problem is. Notice that up until the linker step, right? So each of these lines is a uh, compile and assemble line, right? It, this takes main.c and turns it into main.o. This takes util.c and turns it into util.o. Neither of these will individually have a problem. If I'm just looking at util.c, there's nothing wrong, right? I've got this function. I, you know, I didn't define dinky, but nobody called it, so who cares? If I just look at main.c and I don't look anywhere else. So we, let's just look at, so in here, everything's fine, right? No calls to dinky. You didn't define it. Who cares? Over here, I have a call to dinky. So why didn't the compiler notice? Well, we gave the compiler a prototype, right? The prototype, we gave the compiler a prototype for dinky, which basically is almost a promise to the compiler that this function will exist later on. Uh, but it didn't, right? We never actually gave, we never actually have the code for Dinky uh, anywhere, so that when the linker comes along and says, "Okay, time for me to resolve that reference," right? So if I do a an nm on main dot o, there's an undefined, you know, there's a reference to Dinky here, and if I look inside util dot o. I don't see anything about dinky in here. So what am I supposed to do? There's, you know, this reference will stay undefined and that's going to be a problem. And so we get this error message from the linker that says that dinky was undefined, uh, that there's an undefined reference, which is exactly what this is. An undefined reference to dinky. Okay. But this kind of walks us down a really interesting path that the prototype didn't do anything for us, right? It, we didn't get any value out of, like, the fact that we had this prototype, this is only information to the compiler to check types. Remember that once we get past the compilation step, we have no more type information. So that can lead us into this interesting 
situation where right here I've got a prototype for Dinky with one argument, and I call Dinky of 107. What happens if over here, I keep doing that. I I'll define Dinky, no problem. Here, have have that function. But I want to define it to take two arguments. Uh, and I'll go ahead and change this to a max of n and n2, whatever, right? So now who's going to notice? Well, let's let's try to let's try to make a prediction here. I'm in util.c. Does anything look wrong in here? Right? So I've got my pound includes, I've got a couple functions. I have a function called dinky which takes two arguments. Is there anything wrong with that? No. It's, seems fine, right? Seems legit. Seems legit. Okay, over here, we're going to look specifically in main.c, right? Because uh, every other step besides the linker uh, only looks at one file at a time. So we're going to look at this file and we say, okay, we've got a prototype for dinky. Takes one argument, one int. We've got uh, we've got the a call to dinky. Takes one argument. That's all consistent. Looks legit. Looks legit, right? So our last hope for finding this error is the linker, right? Neither file individually looks wrong. So our only hope is if the linker would notice it, and it doesn't. Why not? Well, I mean, the linker is operating on machine instructions. At the machine instruction level, we don't know about types. If I do the nm again, main.o, we can see this undefined reference to dinky. If I do an nm on util.o, hey look, dinky is defined. It's a function. It's right there. Cool. Awesome. Linker's happy. Program builds completely. So what's going to happen now? Right? So, I, I, so now I'm going to run it. So I can run this thing, right? And, um, you know, that's the wrong answer, right? Uh, so Dinky was supposed to print out the max of its two arguments. I only gave it one argument. Uh, and well, where'd the other one come from? I mean, we know what the assembly looks like. We could even look, right? Um, and we could disassemble. Uh, we could disassemble Dinky really quickly. Oops. Oh, am I? Oops. Ha. <laughs> right. And we can just see, right? Oh, I've got a call to to printf, and it's just going to pull its arguments kind of where you'd expect, right? Um, or here's the here's the call to max, right? Oh, well, okay. It doesn't show the. Um, there's a pass through, but we're going to call max. Max has two arguments. We're just going to pass them through. Um, I mean, the assembly is. Is what's there, right? And the assembly is just going to execute on whatever two registers, right? ESI, uh, EDI, ESI, right? Um, happen to be built in, and that's it. And so one of them happened to have the value two billion, whatever. But oh well. So we don't get we don't get prototype checks. We get no type checking. So yeah, sure, the linker is going to notice. Undefined reference to symbols, but not um, will not detect prototype mismatch. Right, and we can actually go. We can get this. This can go even deeper. Um, and so, any any questions about that so far, though? Uh, for any executable on your computer or that you can even run, yeah. uh, you can actually kind of disassemble it and see the code that was doing the assembly. Oh, yeah. So the question is for any executable, can I actually just go into the executable and disassemble it? Yeah, you can. So you can see how, like, Xcode or, like, whatever. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, it's going to have hundreds of thousands of lines of assembly. It'll take you forever to find anything, but it's there, right? Um, some executables won't have the function names in them, at which point it's going to be very hard for you to disassemble. 
right? If I didn't know, if I didn't know to disassemble Dinky or Main or Max or whatever, then I'm, I'm, it's going to be pretty hard, right? If I just give you a pile of a thousand assembly instructions that go, right? But it's possible, absolutely. Um, if you you know if you find the executable and you fire up GDB and or you you know so if you find some executable and you run NM on it, right? It's going to tell you, hey, here are the functions that are in the executable, and if you can use that. So like, for example, if I do NM on main, right, I see a ton of stuff. And I could go into GDB and just like disassemble any of these things, right, that are functions. And off you go. Right, so main, malloc, whatever. OK. So then there's kind of this follow on question, which is, so what happens if I, so here you can see that you know, you might say, okay, well, this one kind of went through uh, because we had a prototype. I'm going to comment out the call to Dinky now because I don't want to fix it really. Um, we had the prototype. What if we don't have a prototype? So what if we call a function like qsort, but I don't pound include anything? Okay, so up here, uh, I, I don't have a pound include to stdlib, which is where qsort is. Right? So what if I make a call to qsort, and I don't know, I pass it some complete garbage? Like that, right? Like this is just awful, wrong, like this makes no sense. What's going to happen? Who's going to stop us? Who's got to notice? I'm going to make a clean. I want to clear because I'm starting to get a little bit. I want to make. So we get a little bit of help. This is the compiler step, compiler and assembler together, but the assembler never produces errors, so we can just look at uh, this as the compiler, saying, hey, you made a call to a function and you didn't give me a prototype. So I will make one up. Oh, you pass a pointer and an int? All right, sounds good. I believe you. QSort takes a pointer and an int. Got it. Okay? And that's it. And that's all the compiler has to say about that. And then we go to the linker. Now recall, the linker has no type information. So it's not going to know what QSource arguments are. All it says is inside main.o, there is an undefined reference to QSort. Is QSort defined anywhere? Well, by default, the linker will always bring in everything in the standard C library. So that includes things like printf, uh, malloc, the string.h stuff lfind, qsort, and all that. So that all just comes in. And it says, yep, there sure is a function called qsort, and I sure can link your call to that function. So nobody actually stopped me from building this program. I got a warning from the compiler. That's it. Now when I run, of course it's going to segfault, because you called qsort on a null, didn't pass it kind of anything sensible. But you know, very little, very little support from that, right? So we can say here that like the compiler, you know, can uh, prototype problems, warning if no prototype. But the linker's just not going to do any of that. Uh, let's see what else we want to do here. Um, so, yeah. So let me take a actually. Um, so kind of two last points that I want to um, talk about a little bit here. So I'm going to get rid of this call as well because it's. You know, I'll comment them out so you know you can have them if you want to watch your program psych fault because you haven't gotten enough psych faults. Um, but anyway, um, two things I want to, uh, so one other thing I want to talk about with the linker is as it relates to static. So there was, so back with um, C vector and CMAP, we told you to make, that it's a good practice to make your, uh, your functions, your helper functions static. So what does that mean? So you'll notice, um, and this, you know, that both main.c and util.c define a function called max. And you might think, hey, isn't that 
not good, right? Like, why is that, why is that OK? And the reason that's OK is that what static does is it, it means that this function is, like, the linker will not look for this function um, or will not see this function uh, from outside of this file. So in some sense, sort of the function static is, I don't know, I'm just going to put it here, whatever. Function symbol only visible inside util.c. Right? So this means that it's OK to have a static function with the same name defined in two different files. If I didn't use the word static, right, and then I made Now I get a linker error that says you defined max multiple times. The first one was in there, which is super not helpful, but oh well. Uh, it doesn't tell you the line number because it doesn't actually know it. But it basically says, hey, yeah, you know, you, you defining uh, max again, um, you already defined it once in main nutsy. But because it's static, uh, because it was static, then I was allowed to do that, to define it uh, once in each file. Okay. So we can kind of add to this list of errors, uh, multiple non-static definitions. I guess I should say symbol. So when I say symbol, I'm referring to things like functions, um, mostly functions, but also things like global variables. Um, I'm not showing too many global variables here uh, because the assembly for global variables is gross. but Otherwise, um, that's how that goes. OK, so the, the big thing I want you to take away from the linker uh, as we get into things is it's not going to detect prototype stuff. And so then, and it's not going to, you know, it's not doing any of the type checking, right? So then as a result of that, though, one of the key points of pound include was to bring in prototypes, right? If I pound include stdio, I get a prototype for, um, you know, printf and whatnot. So then if I then, so let's say I go down here and I make a call, I say float f equals pow of three, and I don't know, argc or something, right? And then I'll, well, Let's just return it as an int. Let me, let, me, let me cast this. Let me just do this as an int, and then it'll return it as an int. Just so I, I can, I, if I don't use it, I think the compiler is going to get annoyed. It's like, oh, you didn't use your variable. I'm like, yeah, yeah. OK. All right. So here, I want to call pal. And I want to save. Come over here. I want to make clean. Generally, when we're playing with the compiler a lot, you, you'll notice I'm doing a lot of make cleans um, because it forces the compiler to, it forces the entire build process to go through again. So that way we can actually see every step and make sure we understand uh, what each step is doing. Okay, so here we can see that uh, we get the warning from the compiler that says that your call to pal is implicit, like I'm, implic I'm implying a prototype for pal uh, because you didn't show me one. Um, and then we also see this error, which I want to get back to in just a second. So you might say, all right, well, we've got this implicit declaration warning. No big deal, right? I can just pull up the man page for that. And the man page says include math.h. Great, that's going to fix all my problems. So remember what including a .h file really does for your program. It's going to bring in prototypes. If you think about what was in cvector.h or cmap.h, you didn't have the actual code for cvector and cmap. You just had the list of functions and what arguments they took. So that's going to help the compiler out a lot because the compiler will look at those prototypes, but the linker doesn't. So the compiler's happy now. No warnings, no errors from that. 
But this is not going to help the linker. Because the linker doesn't look at your pound defines. Right? The linker does not look at type anything that has anything to do with types whatsoever, and that includes the prototypes for your functions. So this undefined reference to pow has nothing to do with the fact that I forgot to pound include math.h before. This is because the code for the pow function, for how to actually do the pow computation, is not anywhere the linker was expecting it to be. Now that's a little startling. So where is it exactly? Well, we can pull up the man page again, and we can see that there's actually this extra line, link with minus lm. And so what we actually have to do is we have to go into, so what we actually need is we need a line, I'll actually just write it, um, but the correct way to do it would be to modify the make file, is that in addition to these, right, in addition to linking these two, I also need to link LM. This is an exception to the general rule that the standard C library is linked by default. The math library is a separate beast entirely. And uh, for historical reasons and only historical reasons, um, the math library doesn't get linked uh, by default. So if you ever use a, um, one of the math.h functions like pow or log2 or something like that, you need to change the linker line. And pound including math.h is not going to help you solve this linker error. Right, but now if I do it like this, then that will work. And I can use math, but it's not going to, you're not going to see it, um, the output. But got to add this, right? Questions about that? Question, yeah. so dash lm is specifically just for the math one? Yes. Yes. So, so the question is, is dash lm specifically to link with math? Yes. So this, yeah. So this, the dash l means um, add also link with this particular library. The math library is called uh, lib m. Um, so, for example, if I had a program that needed to call c vector, I don't have one readily available. If I had a program that needed to call c vector, then I would need to put that here as well. I need to link with c vector dot o or lib c vec map dot a. Right. So if you go back to your assignment two and your assignment three uh, code, and you do a make, you know, you do a make clean, and then you make again, you'll see lib c, you know, minus l c vec map, which says link with the vector and map library. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so when you link it uh, with, say, like a really big library, does yes. it only take the pieces that it needs? Or does it take the whole library and include it in the executable? Ah, good question. So the question is, if I, if I, ha if I link with a, uh, a library, does it take only the pieces it needs? Generally, no. Generally, it'll take the whole, it'll take everything that was in that library. Um, there are a couple ways you can kind of get around that. Uh, but, I mean, so, so yeah, it, like, there are certain ways to be really smart about it, and there are other ways to just, like, also, it doesn't matter. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a, there are two ways of linking, actually, that I'm not going to talk about, um, static versus dynamic linking. And, and those often have something to do with um, whether you necessarily have to take all the parts and stuff. But you can think of it as basically taking the entire thing and stuffing it in. Um, and that'll be a good enough model. OK. So the whole point for really kind of emphasizing this, you know, like, you, could, you might think of it as just kind of this, you know, really annoying detail that the math library is linked separately. But realizing that I can, by looking at this line versus this line, and by looking at the way this error is structured, I was able to understand what the fix was. I was able to understand, okay, the, we're missing a, a symbol for, for, um, for pow, and that's not going to be something that the pound includes going to fix. Right, and so every quarter we get people asking, "Hey, so I tried to pound include math.h, and I still get a linker error." But of course, they don't call it a linker error, and it's like, "Yes, well, pound include wasn't going to fix that because the prototype information is is not available after the compiler is done." And so once you get to the assembly, um, all you see are names. I want to call pow. I want to call printf. I want to call stircomp. And all the prototype and the, all that checking should have happened earlier. And if you get it wrong uh, from, from there, you're kind of on, on your own. 
And so this is where the prototype can actually help, right? If I do, so now if I do include something like std, uh, stdlib.h and I make a call to qsort, then the compiler is going to notice that, for example. I guess I should just go back real quick and kind of mention this. So here if I do qsort, um, and I'm going to, well, let's just comment this out now. Now, I have given the compiler a prototype. Uh, I added the pound include of studlib.h. So then when I go and make this thing again, the compiler can really stop me and say, whoa, whoa, that prototype is just not correct, right? That, that call is just not correct. And the only way the compiler is able to do this is that we gave it the prototype. So the pound include has a very direct impact on what the compiler is able to check, but it will not have an impact on what the linker is able to resolve. Question. Yes. Start with STD. Ah, so the so every uh, so no so everything the linker can link with by default is what we call libc and so pretty much if you open up the you know CS107 guide to standard C library every function in there is linked by default except for math.h stuff. Um, and that, so if you're not sure, you can pretty much, the, the way to figure this out is you could pull up like a man of QSort, for example, and you don't see any mention of, you know, link with blah, blah, blah. And if you don't see that, then it's linked by default. Okay. Yeah, so with the pound include, right, so with the pound include here, um, the compiler can now tell because what's going to be in that pound include, you can actually see exactly what was in the pound include for the compiler to know. It was this, right? So here it says, hey, stdlib.h contains this line that says qsort takes a void star, a size t, a size t, and then something that didn't fit on the line. Uh, that, that call's definitely wrong. And so... Inside the .h file, we have this line that's going to help the compiler figure that information out. Question? Yep. Um, so also, sometimes I see the file called like a.out, so what exactly is in that file? Oh, so the question is about the a.out file. So if you just type gcc and you don't use the minus o option for, like if I just say gcc uh, main.o util.o, um, and I don't specify what I want to name the output program, oops, I got a, Oh, I had a link with LM or something, but um, if I if I don't specify the name of the output program, uh, GCC defaults to outputting a program called a dot out. So it's just whatever the most recent call to GCC basically did. Yeah, um, but generally that's why you, we generally type make because it kind of names our files nicely. Anything else? So I should say, you know, what's the correct fix uh, for linking with minus lm? You saw that I did it kind of by hand. Um, the correct fix would be to go into the make file and then add it here. Uh, we have a sort of, de there's a dedicated line here for ld libs, and this is what, um, this is where you would put the minus lm to say, okay, now we're going to link with the math library. And if you wanted to link with cvecmap.a, then you could actually add, you know, minus l cvec map. Things like that. Um, and so you, you, you might go back and look through your, you know, previous assignments, see the commands, and you should be able to see these kind of um, linker lines executing. Yeah, so hopefully that gives you a quick sense of what the build process is like and what it, you know, means to have that understanding, right? So now that we know what the steps are, we can kind of figure out, like, oh, what step should I you know, stop the compilation at. So for example, knowing that the preprocessor is doing this find and replace, sometimes it's actually really useful to just stop the process at the preprocessor and say, did it mess with my code in a way I didn't expect? Or I could look at a .o file and say, did it give me, um, you know, the, did it, does it have the, the, 
the definitions or the undefined references that I expect. Um, or whenever we see an error that's coming out from a link line, we can say, oh, I'm missing a particular library. Uh, versus if I see an error coming out from the compiler, you know, and I say, oh, I'm missing a pound include or something. Okay. So you'll see more of this uh, in lab. You'll see some of it in assignment six, you'll see a couple different ways that we can use uh, our knowledge of the build process to actually do some really fancy things to programs when we build them and when we run them. Um, and yeah, so then when we come back, we'll uh, kind of switch gears again and talk about the heap.